hey, I pushed the button. Look, I'm making a video. Look, don't I sound like a mandem? <laughs> uh, hell. I wanted to do a philosophy video, but I'm like, I've got to paint. If I'm going to do a philosophy video, I've got to paint because I've been doing too many philosophy and paint videos. And I don't want to skip a beat if I don't have to. And I've got plenty to do on this painting, even though the sheep is what's on deck. It's what I've been tapping on is this sheep right here, which singular for sheep is shop. Three, three sheep is sheep, and one sheep is shop. Anyway, so I've, I've already been tapping on it a little bit, kind of, kind of just to get myself back in gear. I, I don't have any reference material on it, so I've got to kind of make it up as I go along, which is a little bit of a bummer because I like reference material. Anyway, so that's what I'm working on. And kind of what I wanted to make this video about was about Gary's Vlogger Dome. He's made a new channel. He's calling it Vlogger Dome. I don't particularly think it's going to have any greater success than any of his other channels because he's, he's like trying to clean up his act. Like, okay, I'm not going to swear and I'm not going to put people down a a as if his history doesn't like a tapestry roll over into the present and everybody knows that's his persona. But you know, he's got a goal in mind, so, you know, whatever, it's his project. I thought I'd log into it to see what he does with it, not particularly to get involved with it, because why wouldn't I want to get involved with it? Well, probably a couple of reasons. But one of the reasons, I, I was in his tiny chat Saturday session going off the other night, and that apparently spurred on some some new rules that Gary has about who could get involved and who couldn't get involved in, in Vlogger Dome. And so people like Matt, Thou Art That, and myself could not be involved in Vlogger Dome. And why? Well, because Gary's made rules about language, about what kind of language. <laughs> He's like an elementary school teacher, not swearing. There'll be no swearing in this class. Uh, but um, he doesn't. He doesn't want language that. To me, Gary's committing a contradiction by his rules. But um, he doesn't want anything that's like puffery, anything that's too ambiguous, or anything that he claims doesn't make sense. So keep in mind, he's he is going to be the authority, which he he himself thinks that he hates. He's looking for evidence, but not authority. He doesn't think that all evidence comes down from authorial, you know, writers and thinkers. Or he just doesn't like the word authority, that he's following uh, an authority, or he's following the paradigm of an authority. And yet he is going to become, for Vloggerdom, for this supposed objective argumentation platform to get to the truth, he is going to be the authority about what words are meaningful and what words are not acceptable. <laughs> and, I mean, it's, it's a joke. It's a joke just to, just to listen to him do this and, and butcher language. Like, he's butchering it. Literally, he is on a slab of meat, and he's cutting the head off here and the arm off here and the other the other arm and the legs off here, and he's just standing on one foot, chopping away language bits, different words, words that don't fit into language. So he's on this retractability process with language, which is something I did in my late 20s, was retracting everything, trying to get to uh, words that are not emotional, uh, words that are not uh, quote unquote spiritual, which is a banned word. Um, words that do not point outwardly to, um, I, I guess you would say, 
cloudy ideas, obfuscate might not even be a real word that you would allow because it's too cloudy. Ambiguous might not even be a word. Like he apparently used the word ambiguous to say that he hates ambiguous words. So that one, I guess, will be allowed. But um, spontaneous is not allowed because this has to do with randomness and free will and determinism. Free will is not allowed. Randomness is not allowed. But get a load of this. Symbolic is not allowed. Symbolic. He has a gripe against symbolic. He says symbolic means nothing. <laughs> like it's not pointing to anything. It doesn't have a meaning or a referent, you know. And I, I tried to get at this in tiny chat. I said, you know, he was talking about, well, symbolic communication, he says, is redundant because all of language is symbolic. And I said, well, what about onomatopoeic words? You know, like splat and bang. I say bang, I'm referencing a bang, or I'm not even referencing it, I'm echoing it. Bang. This is what Anton was calling the ionic or iconic words. I think that's what he was calling them. I forget, but in any case, words that rhyme. Rhyming in words, the onomatopoeic words. These are non-symbolic, and yet they're used in language. And then he's like, there's no such thing as symbols. It's all communication. And I'm like, a difference between a written word and a spoken word, the written word has a symbol to it. Chinese characters are symbols. They're symbols that represent pictures first, and the pictures then represent ideas. I mean, language is symbolic, and yet it's a banned word. So get a load of this. Gary is going to take his ultimate authority and ban these words and he's slowly, as he's retracting the language, he's trying to get everybody just right in line on a single track to only follow and only be led to one particular destination. Yet he wants a debate. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I asked Gary to come up with what a debate to his argument would look like provided that there's restriction in the language. I mean, my, my big difference with Gary's philosophy is that I don't think the impetus to badness or the impetus to suffering should be stopped. I think suffering and badness should be mitigated and marginalized, but the mechanism, the impetus, the movement towards it as a possibility I don't think should be should be uh, put in check, and you know, and then all of a sudden Gary says, "Well, then you're advocating for an entire slaughter of six billion, million, billions of billions of people, and you're definitely, you know, you're part of the problem. You're advocating for the death of all these people, and it's all suffering." And and then and then he goes on to explain to somebody. It's, it's not death that matters, it's dying that matters. The dying process, the falling apart, that is Gary's big suffering. He even went on about a little scratch his glove gave him again. Like, it's his kid gloves. He's absolutely petrified of anything that he does not feel he's responsible for that causes an ouchie. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. That's just where I differ from them in the philosophy. So that's a premise, a, a premise difference that I have with them. And I say that pain isn't always a bad, or that suffering isn't always a bad, because there's like this undercurrent. You can get into a sentimental, emotional fixation with not just your pain, but what your pain means what your pain paints, so to speak, not to use a painting as that, but what your pain paints in your psychology. For example, with me, I had an old loving relationship, and when I'm in pain, it reminds me of other times, both other times that I was in pain with her, but I was with her, but it's also a, a general sentiment 
about the pain of being apart from her. I call it a blue moon pain. And so I say that suffering is not always a bad for this sentimental reason. Pain is not always a bad for, for how you react to it, whatever emotional geometry that you might have. But I couldn't use, I couldn't go, I couldn't use the phrase emotional geometry, even though it's like saying logical space, right? And Gary's like, no logical space, either logic, reason, rationality. You can use those three words. But then he won't notice that there's a difference between saying, well, it's logically possible that Wayward Horizon does not have a brain, and hence consciousness is not a byproduct of the brain because it's not, you know, it's still logically possible he doesn't have one. It's not reasonably impossible, or I, I should say it's, it's unreasonable, unrational to say that he doesn't have a brain. But it doesn't mean that it's not logical. And then Gary will get into context. So there's this contextual waving outward, this descriptability of what language is doing, a field, if you will, that one could use to describe what was we called logical space. And Gary doesn't realize that there's already been a history with Wittgenstein and logical positivists of trying to make everything in language logical and that that's what logical positivism is. And, and yet Wittgenstein, who is the huge proponent of the logical positivist, he's kind of a definition of it, he later evolved to realize that there's language games. Once again, another term Gary probably wouldn't use, language games, because it's, it doesn't make sense to call it a game, right? Um, I don't know. I'm just making fun of Gary. Like er, anything anyone uses is going to be under criticism to make certain it. It's not allowed. Deduct one from your your argument <laughs> on blogger no argument. Yes, the rules are made up by me. I'm the authority, and I also happen to win the argument. <laughs> you know, it's it's it's. This is what I mean by he's got nowhere to go, but he's trying to go somewhere. So it'll be fun to watch what he does to see what doesn't and does happen on this 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 attempt of his. Anyway, so thou art that had a video up recently, and he had the phrase process reality, and. In tiny chat, I was using a phrase, even though I forget it right now, but symbolic, okay, I keep wanting to say symbolic communication, but it's not symbolic communication, um, symbolic ether. And by symbolic ether, I mean not logical space, but some of the obfuscated, ambiguous pufferies if you will, games, language games, that we do, that we reside on and towards and with and around, that where symbols, symbolics, symbolic communication echoes. And here I, I grant more leeway into just basic communication. It's as if I'm trying to say that whatever is not only said and transferred to another individual, but what is said to oneself, what is said in, in one's mind, has what, what might be called this process reality. It might be considered a subjectivity that affects a field. And so what you think plays a synchronic role with everything else in the universe. And here I'm becoming a determinist. And I'm looking at all molecules. Like when I think a thought, there is an electron skipping from one, one atom to the next. And it's it's very particular in what it's doing. Now, a quantum leap would be said that a molecule on the other side of the sun could be affected by my, by my thought. 
But speaking outside of just quantum mechanics, just looking at everything, everything has a gravity against everything else. All matter has a gravity against everything else. For example, this straw has a gravity against my mouth. But of course, that's not the force that brought it there. But it's not not the force that brought it there. That's my point. It's symbolically, I told myself, I thought to myself, I was reacting to a totality of facts in my being that allowed me to reach towards that and grab that and bring it to my mouth and 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 in a way uh, a symbolic field a symbolic ether if you will I should I probably shouldn't call it an ether but I want to call it an ether a symbolic field allows that to have a gravity against me. When I think a thought, I know that I could not, I'm not going to get that time back. And so right now at 16.04 on the video, I'm thinking a thought and I'll never get that back. It'll always be synchronic to that, to that happening. And now it's in the past. So it will be a totality of what is. And so when I'm thinking about everything having a gravity on everything else, that's like it's, like, it's as if I'm trying to grant credence to the very act of thinking to oneself. Well, this might be considered something, something like thinking to oneself and then wishful thinking to oneself, which might be like prayer. You know, once again, prayer is not allowed. As, as a word in, in vlogger don't because it's considered non-referential, hence not meaningful, hence not, it's not modeling reality. Gary, Gary, Gary was in mechanics, so all of a sudden, you know, carte blanche, he thinks he can lay out draft science and, and actually add to it. And I'm not going to deny that he could add something if he's got a great idea. He doesn't have to know the explicit language of the mathematics in order to convey the modeling of the mathematics. Kind of like you don't have to know mathematics in order to be a 3D game designer. But notice how even when you watch car commercials and you know the car is made on a computer, like the car itself, I can't really tell the difference between a real car and a 3D modeled car. It's that close now. And then I realize, well, when it's in context, I can tell. When a word is in context, you can tell. And, and so, and, and, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like in 1934, I guess, when King Kong first came out, people were afraid in the audience because they thought that that King Kong was real. Like, they, they couldn't tell the difference, just kind of like how we're awed by certain movies now by just the, the CGI. We consider so much of it real, but you know that it's not real, and there's certain things graphically you can tell by how rough the edges are, or is the color just off, or is it in the context of something too fantastic that, that you know that it's, it's not an image you know, or is a happening happening that would be too expensive to afford to to reenact with with real items. And I, I guess what I'm getting at is when Matt Dower that brings up a concept like process reality. Uh, and he talks about relational ontology. Um, as opposed to an object-oriented ontology, ontology being what is. I wonder if the word ontology is going to be banned from Vloggerdom. But that's what I was talking about earlier, the idea of reducing something to its relations in this area or reducing something to its, its atomistic organism in this case and then and then what his point was is trying to model 
the, these two notions and then model the middle pathway to say there's a middle pathway, a middle ground where you're not just stuck on relations and you're not just stuck on a reduction of the organism. He's trying to find a, a middle path and what that path would look like. Now, is he representing something? Is he modeling something with his words? I say yes, entirely and completely. You just have to know the context in order to get to this. Where with Gary's retractive approach, he's, he's barred the idea of that concept having any real, quote unquote, real meaning. Because all Gary is looking for is to place either objects or facts of objects together and trying to ban, in my opinion, is these banning relationship or attempting to ban relationship. And yet I think he'll fall into a quandary when it comes down to talking about people's motivation for having kids. Um, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll be able to conveniently ban an argument for having kids that's based on either an emotional drive, a happenstance, a context, an ignorance, and he'll just immediately blame it on you're, you're a stupid, skanky cunt and blah, 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 you shouldn't have had a kid. <laughs> you know, he'll, he'll, he's, already, he's already made the track one thing in order to supposedly have this grand argument at a base. Anyway, I'm just going off. I should be focusing here more on the painting. But those are some things that I wanted to bring up. I think, I think, it, you know, and then, and then Gary, <laughs> and then Gary uses the phrase real world, real world. Like he doesn't see the world as being this thing. It's the real world, so already he's being redundant, and yet he's trying to get ready from redundancy. Oh, well, you might be talking about your subjective world. You might be talking about these other ones. I'm using my redundancy for clarification against your ambiguity. <laughs> and yet that's what other people are doing with their language. They're clarifying things. Thou art that had to get to the middle path idea. He had to clarify well, these two reductionistic concepts. You couldn't have got there without that. So Gary doesn't understand where Matt's coming from most of the time. He's reluctant to do so, and this is because Gary's philosophy is one of trying to put logical facts together, reduce language where every word has a history and a meaning and a context, and and people explore the meaning. We're trying to open up to words. We're, you know, in general, people are not trying to erase words and eradicate words. This just, this just shows the whole format and direction of Gary's philosophy of not only trying to extract human bursts from the world and bursts of sentient entities from the world altogether, but he's trying to reduce the very feature which glorifies the human as being, you know, an amazing creature. Uh, you know, one of the most powerful, the most powerful mammal on the planet. And, and Gary wants to reduce that. He, he, would, he would like to slaughter literature, literature just, by, just by that will alone. arose by any other name. There's more in this universe than dreamt of in your philosophy. <laughs> my paraphrasings, my piss poor paraphrasings of proud popular people, personages. Anyway. So anyway, my modeling here is not going to be of the sheep. I'm getting to 24 minutes. Yeah, see, it's, it's basically two tones. So I could put in another tone, but originally it's a white 
a white sheep, white-headed sheep, with white coat, but it should be, I should be adding some dirt to the coat a little bit. But anyway, my point is, is it doesn't matter how explicit I model this, you know, as soon as someone recognizes this sheep as a sheep, it automatically takes on that role as sheep, like it fulfills the word sheep. <laughs> But there's so many infinite ways to depict a sheep and, and get back to the language. There's so many infinite ways to change the font of the word sheep. You know, it's, it's, the, 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 the <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say other than keep your eye on Vlogger Dome. Subscribe if you want to subscribe. But, you know, mark my words right now. It's it's not going to have many more <laughs> many more uh subs than his amendum channel if it gets that popular at all. I mean, maybe I'll eat my words on this. <laughs> and okay, here's another thing Gary was going at in terms of explicitity is you can't say just about two times almost four. You can't say that type of thing. And yet I, it's so funny. I'm <laughs> I was just measuring these these abstracts that I've been working on. Right? And and I was just I was doing the ratio for it. And I was kind of like, okay, roughly what is that? Oh, that's like three, three and a half inches, kind of by one, two, three, four, twelve-ish, twelve-ish inches. So somewhere around, you know, one-fourth, roughly. And I, I'm smudging the calculation, you know, uh, two sevenths, you know, it, it's like you can totally say just abouts and almost and divide them in and out and, and be wrong with your calculation if you want and then be right again with it later. I mean, even Wittgenstein brought up the the French meter stick. You know, this is the rule for the French meter stick. This is how long a meter is. And, you know, originally it was put in France, and then it was even criticized that the temperature on this meter stick, whatever the temperature is, is going to affect the length. And so they, to make it more exact, they put it inside of a temperature controlled device. And, and they've got it marked on the outside. Now the marks on the outside of the temperature controlled device is what is measured up against to know whether or not something is really a meter or what we call a meter. And that's what it comes down to is a lot of language is use. It's what we call something. It's what we agree upon something. So if Gary's going to categorically cut something out for the sake of doing it, it's, it's just, it's just, it's, it's stupid. It shows his inflexibility. And, um, and everybody, I mean, Zombie Picture Show doesn't argue with Gary, you know. Who argues with Gary anymore, you know? I might throw out something because I'll just go full contra to all of his statements. But I don't really spend my time arguing against Gary anymore. And so what, you get Hofliday, who's picking apart mathematical semantic constructs which I say is fine, you know, and I mean, everybody else has gone mute and Gary looks at this as a victory instead of just 
uh, uh, seeing that everybody is saying, God, we're on different pages. Gary is not on our page. He doesn't move this way. And Gary marks this, you know, this is a stamp of progress for Gary. This is a stamp of uh, approximation to greater truth in Gary's eyes instead of Instead of everybody saying, wow, here, here's this guy that not only is he bad socially, but philosophically he is reducing everything right out of, he's reducing conversation to the most unbearable point possible. And so I wonder what Gary's idea of an opposition to his argument would look like. You know, it's almost like if he doesn't believe that it's possible to have an opposition to his argument, well, he, I, I'm around to hopefully grant him some notion that there's opposition to his argument out of hand. Uh, what was I going to get at? Um, oh, spiritualism. Spiritualism is not allowed. Okay, so if everybody goes to a ball game and they're all cheering and they're roaring and you're thinking baseball, ah, baseball, I love baseball, you can say the spirit of the game. And that can mean what the players are doing, they're spitting, they're chewing, they're, they're moving through a history of the game, they're reiterating the game. They, they have virtue relative to the rules of the game. They're playing it. They're doing it in their own particular style and fashion. So there's a history to the game which invokes the crowd to roar. And that's the spirit of the game. The spirit of the game can be found in the game itself. It could be found in an echo of history. It could be found in an individual's emotive reaction to the roaring, to the fact that it's all circumlocuted, oh, can't use that word, around a particular practice, that there's an energy involved that is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's really what's meant by spirit, something that's greater than the materiality, something that includes the history, something that includes sentimentality. something that includes emotions, things that include what we are, we are organisms. This idea that our consciousness is a byproduct of the brain, well, my, my, you know, I don't even know whether or not my head has to be here in order to paint this painting sometimes. It feels as if the hand is doing the painting on its own. You know, I'm not really giving a whole hell of a lot of thought to every little dollop that I'm putting on here. <laughs> and you could just say, well, that shows, does Luke. Anyway. Oh, um, yeah, so I wanted, I, I, I basically wanted to say, you know, you get the religious spiritualism which Gary wants to ban from the room. You can't use anything that out of hand carte blanche would just be a trump card like throwing down the God card. He wants evidences of stacked information such as evolutionary theory to be a weight. You know, once again, who is going to do the judging if not Gary himself as to what is truer and what is not truer? I was speaking from my, my Ken, friend in Canada, and we were talking about consent. This is a sidestep topic. And she said, you know, I can't remember, so how can I say that I didn't? I don't know everything. I'm agnostic. How do I know I didn't give consent? Or something in that effect. I don't want to paraphrase her. I don't want to quote her by any means. But there's the hard problem of consent in Gary's eyes. And once again, I say it's not about the impetus of what possibly causes pain or suffering to be questioned. So the premises are different. But if I, even if I stepped into his premise, 
um, there's this spiritual idea of waking up in one's consciousness and almost believing that there could have been a, a you prior to you that was in some different form or manifestation and that that you moved into the gobule that was the conception of the organism that you are now. This would be considered like resurrection or um, reincarnation, the, these ideas of a pluralistic ality of being. This is a history of spiritualism. But it's not so much stating resurrection or reincarnation as being what spiritualism, you know, what I mean by spiritualism if I say I'm a spiritualist, as much as it is the consideration of those ideas relative to a blind spot, a doubting, and a lingual possibility. Once again, a symbolic ether that if I can think the idea, then it's a thought idea. It's not representational, but you can't, you could doubt whether or not it could be representational. Could it be true that we are re reincarnated beings? Could it be true? Well, we don't have a lot of evidence for it. We do have a lot of testimony and a lot of emotional descriptions. We have people that have whole belief systems around it. So there's a weight of hearsay and there, there's a weight of testimonial evidence that comes along with it. But there's also our organism that knows the history of its own consciousness bumping up to a horizon line where you can't see earlier than your earliest memories. There's an accepting of all things learned from an infant on that are stacks of authority bounding things that we call facts that we agree to, that we bound ourselves to. And these come down to ways to describe the information that's provided. Um, I don't believe, I believe that information and knowledge is a process and that it's handed down. I don't believe, so there's like a cultural evolution and I think this butts up against Gary's notion of matter-of-fact truth. Gary thinks that there's matter-of-fact truth that we can see and we can glom to, but in fact I'm saying no, you sense a truth and then you you bond to a history of culturally inherited information that you agree to and that that, that locute that that interlocular bit of information is separating you from truth. You have to follow, you have to be tracked to the truth based on a history of mounted evidence and your your oh, I forget the word that I want to use there. Predisposition. Anyway, boy, I'm going on 40 minutes. <laughs> I didn't get the sheep done. I tapped away at it. It looks a little better than it did 20 minutes ago, but but not much. So I've got to work on the details of that. Um, you know, I think authority resembles tyranny in a way. In one way, it's a good thing, and one thing we all agree to it, and in another way it resembles tyranny. I don't believe it is tyranny, but it resembles tyranny, especially from like a governmental standpoint. But that's a whole different topic. I forget what else Gary said in his video. He had a few other comments in there that I was like, oh, oh, God, is he saying that? Is he doing that again? It's almost like he doesn't he doesn't want to see the flow. You know, he believes he can just blink and correct himself and, and erase his past 
and all of a sudden make a new channel, and that's a dividing line between the bad Gary that swears and curses and believes in this, and the new Gary which thinks that his rules are more rational, and he doesn't swear, and he doesn't put people down. You know, he doesn't see himself as this full organismal tapestry that has built itself to the entirety of the being that Gary is now from one blink to the other. He actually falls in accord to, according to Thou Art That, one of Whitehead's notions of moments of ending and then becoming again. And this is what is meant by the telos. You go so far, it ends, and then you start over again. You do start over with every blink of the eye. So, by the end of this video, when I turn it off, if you disagree with me, you get to forgive me entirely. Because it's all starting over with the next video that you watch. Okay. Uh, oh, God, what else did I want to mention? Did I want to mention anything else? Oh. <laughs> Oh, uh, thanks, Wayward, for looking at the uh, Merkaba video. Um, I'll uh, not mix topics right now. Okay, thanks. Bye.